I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the owners here, and I want to welcome Jake, Jacob Weisberg. Uh, Jacob is the editor in chief of Slate Magazine. Uh, he's had a long, uh, rich career in journalism. He's worked for the New Republic. He writes for, for the New York Times, the Financial Times, Vanity Fair, and a number of other uh, journalism sources. Uh, and incidentally, that he was he was not editor in chief of Slate in two thousand. In two thousand, he was a political reporter much further down the rung rung for Slate, and he was covering the new President Bush at that time. Uh, I don't know how many people here read the op-ed piece, piece that was in the New York Times that Jacob wrote two years two days ago. Uh, and it was a very, very, I found it was a very interesting piece because that he spoke of uh, President Bush's 2001 State of the Union address in which the Bush spoke as a compassionate conservative who wanted to extend Medicare benefits, preserve Social Security, and protect the environment. The Bush tragedy, the title of our book tonight, is the story of how such fine words ended in such harsh realities. Uh, Jacob Weisberg is very pre precise uh, in his character characterization of Bush as not a bad president, but a failed president. Uh, he says he has no ax to grind with President Bush. But it is the intention of his book to help us understand the magnitude of the Bush failure. The father-son relationship between George H.W. and George W. lies at the core of the second Bush presidency and its spectacular flame-out. Uh, Jacob Weisberg frames this in the language of Greek tragedy and Shakespearean drama. In the, in the Bush tragedy is that the son's ungovernable relationship with his father ended up governing us all. As we thought about in parallels of previous presidents, LBJ with Macbeth, uh, Nixon with uh, Richard III, Jacob Weisberg finds Bush's darker side uh, in Prince Hal of the uh, Shakespeare Henry series. Um, he um, then says after uh, placing that um, role for uh, President Bush as, Bush as Prince Hal, that back to, again, he's trying to find the, bla the black box that explains this just flame out crash that he has, as he uh, diagnoses the Bush presidency. And uh, that's what our book is all about. He feels he's found the black box, and he's here tonight to tell us what's in it. Barbara, thank you so much for that nice introduction and for having me here at Politics and Prose. Uh-oh, I can tell what that is. Better turn that off. Um, and it's great to see so many people here. I'm sorry there aren't seats for everyone, but I take this as uh, evidence that although exhaustion with the, with the Bush presidency is fairly advanced, there are still people interested in trying to understand what went wrong. Um, my story is about the downfall of, of a family dynasty as well as a political dynasty. And the part I thought I would talk about tonight is the personal, the familial, the psychological side of the story. And I don't mean to offer a simplistic Freudian reading of George W. Bush. I want to offer a complicated Freudian reading. <laughs> um, um, I think you can partially explain uh, Bush's choices, including the big one in Iraq, by the son's need to rebel, to differentiate himself, to exceed his father, and diminish his father. But at the same time, I think Bush has been embarked on a kind of effort at vindication not just of a father who was turned out of office by the Clintons, people the Bush family has contempt for, but vindication of the Bush family as a whole. And I think Bush's uh, presidency, and I think you could argue, in fact, Bush's entire life has organized itself around this complicated interplay of parental emulation and contradiction. Um, I think it's been a painful business in the Bush family. And uh, let me just give you one little vignette 
which is from 2004 at the time of the Republican convention in New York. Uh, former President Bush has been incredibly disciplined about not allowing there to be any distance between himself and his son on policy, criticize his son in any way to suggest that he feels implicated by his son's decision. But um, this one time in, in 2004, uh, former President Bush was actually on Don Imus' show. And I think he was feeling so wounded by the way his son had been treating him that, that he, he let it out. And uh, what, the, what set him off was when Imus quoted a remark that George W. Bush, President Bush, had made in an interview with the Washington Times when he said that in Iraq he didn't intend to cut and run like they did in 1991. And uh, this somehow got to his father. And he said, well, I didn't like that much. He said, frankly, it hurt a little bit. And th then he went on, and I thought this was an incredibly revealing answer. Former President Bush said, I don't think he personally felt that I have to compete with my dad. You read all this psychobabble stuff, that's me, and I, and I know it's not true. These damn issues now, for me, they don't matter. What does matter, though, is, is if they have assigned things to him in some salon in the Upper East Side of New York that he's trying to get out from under the shadow to escape his father and to have his own legacy and not his dad. Well, maybe there were people around him four years ago who felt that way, but now if you unpack that answer, there's a progression. First, he says, it's not true that my son's do it, saying this to get at me. Then he says, it bothers me that the intellectual snobs in New York are saying it. And finally, he says, Karl Rove's responsible for it. <laughs> um, now, as a kid growing up in Midland, Texas, um, George Bush modeled himself on this heroic father. And I think it's um, easy to forget what a heroic figure Bush was, especially in his own family, this war hero, this successful businessman, this successful politician. And there's this great rosebud moment when George W. Bush is stretched out on the floor of the ranch house, which you can now visit in Midland, Texas. It's the George W. Bush birthplace or, or early family home. And uh, he's looking at this family scrapbook, and it is a little bit of rubber from the raft that saved his father's life when he was shot down over the Pacific. And you can just think a little bit what it's like to grow up with a father who had cast such an imposing shadow in the family. And of course, George W. Bush tried to do all of the things that his dad did. Um, he went to the same schools. He tried to play the same sports, mainly baseball. He tried to fly warplanes. He went into the oil business. He went back to Midland, Texas to go into the oil business. He ran for office when he ran for Congress in 1978. But for that whole first part of his life, he wasn't good at any of that. Um, and I think the fact that he was born to this tremendous privilege just made the sense of disappointment at not being good at it um, all, the, all the more disappointing to him. Um, he was clearly unhappy growing up. He developed a drinking problem, and he developed, um, I think, what could be fairly called the nasty streak. He cultivated this idea of himself as someone who would never break a sweat, who wasn't trying that hard, even though he was, in a sense, trying very hard. And he tried to give off this idea, well, I might not be accomplishing what my dad did, but I'm not really trying to accomplish anything. But as he got older, this contrast in their stories and their situations got even more dramatic. At age 30, his father was worth a million dollars, and a million dollars was a lot of money back then. He had a house, a burgeoning business, a growing family. Now, at age 30, the son, George W. Bush, was living over a garage surrounded by dirty clothes. He was out drinking most nights. His business wasn't working. And uh, at that point in Midland, Texas, was a, an oil boom, the oil boom in the 1970s, which was an even bigger boom than his father uh, uh, made, his, made his mark in in the 1950s. And it wasn't working. And it was very interesting how they each approached the oil business. His father approached the, the business very methodically from the ground up. He started painting oil rigs. He was a salesman of drill bits. He did every, every thing you can do to understand it. Uh, but his son thought it was a matter of luck whether you struck oil. And he kept rolling the dice, and, the, and they kept coming up snake eyes. Um, and then he rolled them again by running for Congress when he had no real qualifications in 1978. Um, and... Uh, you know, one of the things that happened, he lost that race, and, and one of the things that was happening in that, soon after that period is his younger brother Jeb, who he had a very competitive relationship with, six and a half years younger, started to succeed. 
And Jeb, in a way, lived the real family dream by moving to a new, lighting out for new territory in Miami, um, making some money in business, a different place, a different business, uh, the real estate business. And then Jeb went into politics and became uh, Secretary of Commerce in Miami. And I think seeing his younger brother succeed in that way and become the sort of family success story and the repository of the hopes of the next generation for the Bush family is part of what motivated George W. to pull himself together uh, and to stop drinking and to, and to find religion and to start to discipline himself. Now, uh, if you want to understand this, this uh, father-son dynamic, you have to do something that most students of politics don't do enough of, in my opinion, which is you need to read Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> What, um, what both Bushes feel, I think, but, but very seldom say, really does come through in the, in the sequence, um, sometimes called the Henriad, uh, which begins with Richard II and encompasses Henry IV, parts one and two, and then Henry V. And uh, to summarize, just if you um, don't remember all the details, um, Henry IV takes power at the end of Richard II, um, but then in Henry IV, part one, he grows frustrated with his son, Prince Hal, who's out carousing with Falstaff, who's sort of a, a drunken, drunken lout, and uh, who isn't taking his family responsibility seriously. This is the, his old, eldest son who's going to inherit the throne. And uh, he shows no capacity for doing what he's supposed to do. And the father wrings his hands and, and, and worries about this constantly. But eventually, Prince Hal pulls himself together. He defeats this rebellion that threatens his father's reign. And uh, he repudiates Falstaff. Um, presumably stops drinking, finds God, and uh, he takes power as Henry V, the warrior king, who is interestingly the most religious of Shakespeare's kings, as well as, as the most militaristic. Um, and uh, I think that period until 1986, when he quit drinking, was uh, W's Prince Hal period. He, w he was eager to assume this family mantle, but he kept showing how unfit he was for it, but being so unserious, by failing in business, and he's struggling with the burden of his father's accomplishments, the expectations of his family, and their disappointment in them. And each time he tries something and, and fails, it produces this heightened sense of dependence, of inadequacy, and frustration. Uh, but in, in the Shakespeare plays, Prince Harry vows to prove the people who don't believe in him wrong. Uh, and there's a metaphor he uses at one s point when he gives a sol soliloquy. He says he's going to be like the sun, who people are all the more amazed by when it breaks through the clouds unexpectedly. And, and there it is. It's Bush's game of lowering expectations, which is something he's done his whole life, and which, interestingly, Prince Hal does in the Shakespeare play. Uh, and like Prince Hal, George W. surprises everybody with this late embrace of adulthood. Um, in, in Shakespeare, Prince Harry repudiates his al alternative father, Falstaff, and Bush, in, in a similar way, kind of cast off this misspent youth. Um, when he quit drinking, he found God. But I think the most important part of that is not the religion, not the quitting drinking, but that he figured out how to define himself as different from his father, in opposition to his father, really in almost every way. And you can look at, I think, almost any aspect of his character and see this. But if you just look at religion for an example, it's not just that they're from different dom denominations. It's that Bush comes from this old line Episcopal family that sees, you know, religious enthusiasm as a kind of bad taste. It's very high church, um, very stylistically, very much the opposite of the born-again evangelical type of religion which the son adopted. Uh, but that helped George W. in his father's eyes because when his father was organizing his presidential campaign uh, that was going to be in 1988, his big problem was the evangelicals. Bush was, they were out of sympathy with him. He was out of sympathy with them. When he was asked the question, uh, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, he gave, Bush Sr. gave the wrong answer. Um, and uh, his son knew what to say in those situations, and his son had to help to coach him in this. And it was actually tremendously successful. 1988, people were, forget this, but it was the high watermark for evangelical support of the Republicans. And that year, Bush, former President Bush got 81% of the evangelical Christian vote, which is more than Ronald Reagan ever got. Of course, it plummeted in 1992, partly because it was a bit of a put-on, and he didn't really know how to handle them very well once he was in, in office. 
but it was his son working on the campaign, moved to Washington to work on the campaign, who, who helped him do that. And it was the first time the son had really done something to, to gain his father's respect, I think. And it was because he had defined himself as a very different kind of person who related to ver very different kind of people. Um, and he continued in that vein. He moved back to Texas and, and uh, made this deal to um, uh, run the Texas Rangers, be a part owner in the Texas Angel Rangers, which finally made him rich. Um, and the big reversal moment, and all this time he's trying to catch Jeb, who's ahead of him. And the family was very focused on Jeb running for governor of Florida in 1994. And George W. Bush, even in 1990, said, I want to run for governor of Texas. And they talked him out of it, partly because they, his father was still in the White House and partly because they thought it would hurt Jeb's career. And in 1994, he said, I'm really going to run for governor of Texas. And his mother was very upset did everything she could to try to get him not to run because they thought it would take money away from Jeb, it would take attention away from Jeb. And he, at that point, he was, he was defying his parents, as I think he has since this sort of midlife crisis. And um, the big surprise was that Jeb lost and George W. won. And that really reversed the roles and restored primogeniture, that the, that the eldest son was, was the leader of the next generation in the family. Um, that's some of the psychology, but the political side of the story is what really matters. Conservatives had set up this opposition between George H.W. Bush's moderation and, and Reagan's bold conservative. And at, at this point, after his father loses in 1992, uh, W. sides with the conservatives against his father. Um, he, accept this, he, he accepts, first of all, that his father presidency failed because he wasn't reelected, and that he failed because he wasn't really conservative enough, that he had violated his no new taxes pledge, and particularly on foreign policy, that he had not stood up uh, for American ideals in the waning days of the Soviet Union strongly enough, that neoconservatives were, uh, always complained that when the Berlin Wall fell, former President Bush didn't even make a speech. Um, and he wasn't tough enough on China. And, of course, the most important part of their critique was that he had left Saddam in power, that he didn't, that he didn't finish the business he started in Iraq. Um, and at that point, when he's governor of Texas, he's thinking about running for president, George W. Bush doesn't know very much about foreign policy, but he accepts this argument. And in many ways, he's defining his foreign policy simply in opposition to what his father did. So he knows he wants to be more supportive of Israel um, because part of this critique is that his father was too skeptical of Israel. He wants to be less accommodating to China. And he doesn't want his father's key people, Brent Scowcroft, James Baker, anywhere around him. He's okay with some of the outer circle people, Dick Cheney, um, Colin Powell, Condi Rice, who, who can transfer their loyalty to him. But the people who were his father's close friends, he not only doesn't want around, but he, he expresses this, in Scowcroft's case, this uh, sort of otherwise hard to explain hostility. Um, so I think, uh, I want to save a lot of time for questions here, so I want to get through this a little bit here. But I think it's also, it, it, it's a, a policy level, but it is also very much at the uh, stylistic level and the level of how you do things. So the way he makes decisions is the opposite of his father. Um, the way he presents himself as a leader is the opposite of his father. His father derided having the vision thing. He said, I'm not a visionary. I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. I'm a realist. Well, his son sets him up, himself up as a visionary. His father was, was methodical. He, was, uh, he would take his time making a decision. He liked to hear an argument. Um, and he was capable of changing his mind. The son makes himself, in this great nickname, he finally gave himself the decider. He makes a decision faster than anybody. Um, he doesn't revisit it or re-examine it. He doesn't want to hear an argument about it. And once he makes it, he is absolutely firm. And, you know, his father, Dana Carvey, famously mocked his father for, you know, wouldn't be prudent. He was too prudent. And the son doesn't, isn't prudent. He's going to be bold. Um, now, we've to, you know, cut to the chase. He, he decides to invade Iraq. And there's still a lot we don't know about that decision. Um, I think I isolate a few interesting things about it, including when it was made. Uh, but um, 
but one thing we do know for certain is that it was made very quickly and without understanding, with a, with a lot of a, without a lot of understanding of the situation. He didn't. Bush did not reportedly did not know the difference between uh, Sunni and Shiite Muslims at the time of the invasion of Iraq. Um, and uh, you know, I think when we do one day when we do get the archives or the emails or the, the emails that have been deleted or maybe they'll be, the deleted emails will be recovered. But I do think that we're likely to find that the key decisions of the Bush presidency were made in a room with two people, George Bush and Dick Cheney. Uh, and for that reason, I think we ne may never know that much about them, but we know a lot about what went into that room. I mean, in some ways, that room is the black box where the decisions were made. Um, but uh, I, think, I think the decision to invade Iraq was made in exactly that way. And one of the amazing clues about this is that uh, someone named Richard Hawes, who was director of policy planning under Colin Powell at the State Department, was, thought the war was a bad idea. He was someone who had worked for, for the first President Bush. He thought it wasn't prudent. Um, and he was going to go and present his, he wanted to present his case to uh, Condi Rice, the national security advisor, uh, against the war. And this was in the beginning of July 2002. And um, Condi Rice said, you save your breath, the decision's been made. And Haas was shocked, and he called up Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, who was his boss, and said, what gives? And Powell said, that can't be right. And then Powell called him back and said, eh, turns out you're right. Uh, and that tells us two things. One, it helps us isolate when the decision was made. And I think, looking at a few other circumstances, it had to be made right around the 4th of July, 2002, which means much of the sh what followed about going to the United Nations and so on really was a charade. The decision had been taken at that point. But also that there was no decision-making process because it is impossible for there to have been a decision-making process that did not involve the Secretary of State. Um, so it's possible, I think, if I had to guess, I would say... Condi Rice was the first person outside the room with Bush and Cheney in it who found out. Um, but it was essentially, it, it was essentially a, a snap decision of some kind made in private. Um, now, going back to the psychological side of our story a little bit, there is that moment when he's wearing the flight suit under the Mission Accomplished banner. Um, when, when George W. Bush feels it's all come together for him, he'd, he'd outdone his father. And uh, there's tremendous resonance to that moment, of course, because his father, over the Pacific, flew bombing missions off an aircraft carrier and did this very daring landing, known as a tail hook landing, which is when the plane is caught by a wire stretched across the deck of the aircraft carrier. That was the landing Bush made on the deck of the USS Lincoln. Um, and I think this, the resonance of that episode is not just that he was prematurely declaring victory in the war, but that he had, he had done what his father had done. And in fact, he had gone beyond his father. He had exceeded his father. He had finished his father's business. Um, and of course, there's the great line there, thereafter when uh, Bob Woodward was interviewing him for, for one of his books and asked him if he got advice about Iraq from his father. And he said, I get advice from a higher father. Uh, um, so... Uh, just to wind up a little bit here, as, as, the, as the Iraq uh, war got worse and worse, I think his father's position got more and more awkward. Um, the elder Bush, he's a very emotional man, um, and he does sometimes cry in public, but towards the end of 2006, he was crying a lot at public events. He, he broke down when he was talking about his, mo his late mother on the Larry King show one night when I saw him. He cried when they christened the aircraft carrier um, George H.W. Bush, when both his sons were present. But the, the episode I thought was most telling was when he spoke at the Florida House of Delegates at a ceremony for the end of Jeb's governorship. And he was talking about how Jeb didn't whine and he didn't complain when there were all these unfair attacks against him in 1994. Remember the year that George W. won and he lost. And he said, the true measure of a man is how you handle victory and also defeat. Uh, that was three weeks after the Republicans had lost control of both houses of Congress in, in the 2006 midterm. The Iraq study group report was coming out the next day, and there was enough of an Oedipal dynamic to that with the father's friends, Baker Scowcroft, Robert Gates, 
rebuking the sun that, that I think, you know, uh, was something that many people remarked on at the time. Uh, I think the father, and this is part of the poignancy of this whole story, I think he understands that his son has blundered in large part because of his relationship with him. Um, feeling inadequate, needing to be different, George W. Bush tried to make himself into his father's opposite. He damaged the country trying to live up to, to challenge, to win the respect of the old man. But I think George H. W. Bush doesn't blame his son for that. I think he blames himself a lot for it. And uh, that's part of why I call my book The Bush Tragedy. It's a, it's a family tragedy, dynastic tragedy, as well as a national tragedy and an international tragedy. This flawed son thinks he can prove himself and vindicate his family by repudiating his father's bad decisions. But then he ends up doing just the opposite of what he, t what he intends. He vindicates his father as a wise man. And the father's presidency is looking better and better in light of the sons. Uh, and he does that by making a fool out of himself and bringing the family dynasty to an end. We can't say for certain that it's an end, but it's, um, it's, it's not looking like it has a lot of life in it at the moment. I think Jeb at the moment does not feel that the dynasty has a lot, has a lot of room to run. So uh, I'd like to end with a few lines from Shakespeare, from, from Henry IV, Part II. Uh, and this comes from Act Four, where the dying King Henry thinks his son is being a little too quick to grab the crown away from him while he's still alive. And this is part of his speech. He says, for this, the, the foolish, over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts, their brains with care, their bones with industry. For this, they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange achieved gold. For this they have been thoughtful to invest their sons with arts and martial exercises, when, like the bee, culling from every flower the virtuous sweets, our thighs packed with wax, our mouths with honey, we bring it to the hive, and like the bees, are murdered for our pains. Thank you. So I'll be happy to take questions of, about uh, about anything. Excuse me. Certainly. Thank you. Excuse me. I have to bring it down. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, it has always been my thought that George W. Bush was not as stupid as many of us initially thought. Rather, he had some learning disabilities. What is your take on that? I agree with that. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm. The other thing I've done is collect Bushisms over the years, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I sometimes joke that this book is my penance for for doing that because one of the things Bushisms do is I think they make Bush sound stupider than he is or stupid in a way he isn't, um, and I do think he does have some sort of language processing impairment that is probably akin to dyslexia, and dyslexia does run in the family, but I don't think it's dyslexia because if you watch the State of the Union, you see he has no trouble reading a teleprompter. And he's, he's, um, and he's, he is a reader, actually. He's become a reader, I think, in the White House. He reads a lot. He reads a lot of history, in part, because I think he's looking for vindication in it. Um, but um, I think there is some language problem which makes him sound stupid. He hasn't, the, one of my favorite Bushisms of all time was when uh, Gail Sheehy, this was during the 2000 campaign, Gail Sheehy had written a piece about him in Vanity Fair that said he did have dyslexia. And he, and he was, it was asked about it, and he said, that woman who said uh, I had dyslexia, I never interviewed her. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the second question I had for you is, uh, in these waning days, uh, does he now have greater respect for his father and his father's accomplishments? Uh, I, I think you have to start by saying it's, it's, it's the big mystery. And... Any, almost anything you say is, is speculation because neither of them have revealed anything about their relationship. If, if I had to guess, um, I, think the, I think his father, I think, well, and I, I've, I've, I've talked to a few people who've given me some, some sense of this. I think both parents are very angry. I think his mother is angry at him and his father is angry at the people around him. I think the father is very angry at uh, Cheney and at Rumsfeld and blames them. And I think the mother probably blames the son a little bit. And I think the son isn't, um, 
he does not uh, he does not concede much easily. I mean, I think he's never I think he's never been open in his hostility to his father. So he wouldn't accept the premise that what he's doing is to get at his father in any way or to challenge his father. Um, at the same time, I don't think he accepts enough of the critique to suggest that he recognizes there's a problem. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Hi. Why has President Bush permitted the Vice President Cheney to be the real President of the United States for the last seven years? Um, well, obviously, he doesn't see it quite that way. And in fact, <laughs> he's very, um, uh, Bush is uh, very intent on looking, to particularly the people around him, like he's in charge. And I think one of the reasons Cheney has been so good at arrogating power to himself is he's very good at receding and making Bush feel like he's in charge and making Bush look like he's in control. And I think, I think there's an interesting psychology to that relationship. And I think one of the things Cheney learned, I think he learned to play on the son's feelings towards his father and how to present things in such a way that his son would see them as corrections to his father. But the other side of it, and this is probably the, um, the less disputable point, um, Cheney had a very clear idea of the presidency. Cheney's views have been extremely consistent, and he's expressed them quite openly, his views about executive power, the need for a powerful executive to combat security threats to the United States. He was a Cold War hawk, and his views uh, in the war on terrorism are, are a straightforward extrapolation of his hawkishness during the Cold War. He feels that security threats out there, and nobody but him takes them seriously, and we need a powerful president to deal with them. Well, I think that idea filled a kind of intellectual vacuum around the presidency after September 11th. But it's also a very appealing idea to any president, the idea being that, Mr. President, you have the power, Congress doesn't have the power, the courts don't have the power, the press is being unfair to you, you can do whatever you want. Presidents like to hear that. Even Democratic <laughs> presidents sometimes like to hear that. Yeah. Uh, a little piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, Bush, um, why didn't he volunteer for Vietnam? He's a year older than I am. Um, his father was a war hero. Uh, this was a great opportunity to be a war hero, and they were for the war, and he deliberately took a way out. Um, I sometimes wonder if he had really thought he was going to be in the war, he would have paid more attention to it, and maybe we wouldn't be where we are today. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, you know, the conventional explanation I don't think is wrong. I mean, I don't think he wanted to go to Vietnam. Not many people of his, of his class, of his background, wanted to go or did go. But uh, I guess I credit his own explanation a little more than most people do. He always they said when, they asked, when, when they've asked him, why did you want to be in the Air National Guard? He said, I want to fly planes like my daddy did. And he found a way to do that that was, you know, again, a sort of parody of his father's heroism. Um, but I think in another way, he sort of felt cheated because a lot of these opportunities for heroism that his father had weren't available to him. The Vietnam War wasn't the Second World War. You couldn't go to Vietnam and be a war hero in the same way. It wasn't, it wasn't an unambiguously virtuous war. So the opportunity for heroism wasn't the same. But I think, uh, I think his, I don't think he wanted to go to Vietnam, but I think his desire to fly warplanes was real. Actually, um, uh, Bush's war service, whatever it was, or whatever one wants to call it, uh, makes is it makes uh, Bill Clinton uh, puts everything into perspective. Uh, when I was in medical school, I enjoyed my psychiatry very much, and you use the term psychobabble. Um, and in reality, unless you can interrogate or interview somebody at great length, uh, everything becomes speculation. I also had a chance to hear some of the IMUS uh, interviews before IMUS was thrown off the air. And when uh, 41 was uh, speaking with IMUS, he, he was willing to have Barbara come on the air with IMUS, and she wouldn't do it because was, she was afraid that uh, he would call her an old prune. Uh, I also, like my Shakespeare, when NYU had an uptown campus, uh, it was Falstaff who said, discretion is the better course of valor. Uh, uh, Puck said to Oberon, 
uh, what fools these mortals be. The real sin of uh, the Bush administration is to be catering to a a, a, a base, a, a far-right base, rather than use discretion uh, and also be fiercely loyal to people who don't deserve to be loyal to. And the other deal was Bush 41 failed. Bush 41 failed because of Ross Perot. Right. Okay, well, I think that's, I'll take that as a comment and not as a question, but thank you. Is there next? Um, I could be remembering this wrong, but I've always had this memory that uh, w wasn't that enthusiastic of a candidate in 99, 2000, for the presidency. That he was pulled in a little bit, like, well, you have name recognition, help us out here. Is, is that uh, true? My or? reading of that's a little different. I think he tried to, tried to create an impression of reluctance and that he was having a hard time making up his mind. And, you know, that's the, that's the myth of Cincinnati. It goes back to George Washington. You're not supposed to really want to be president. You're supposed to look like you're, the country is, is, needs you and you're leaving your business and your family against your, against your preference. So I think he was playing that game a little bit. I think he uh, certainly, be, before he was reelected as governor of Texas in 1998, he was behind the scenes organizing a presidential campaign. Karl Rove was organizing a presidential campaign for him and talking very openly about, about the campaign. So I think some of that was a little bit of a show. Yeah, sure. I uh, missed the first 10 minutes of your talk, so if this is redundant, to let me know. But uh, I wondered your thoughts about the impact of uh, George W.'s alcoholism, uh, just the fact that Ron Suskind and, uh, uh, and Paul O'Neill have talked about uh, his, uh, his heavy drinking. He says he's had his last drink in 1986, and religion has obviously allowed him uh, to become sober. And we now know that uh, heavy drinking in young adulthood can have a, an impact on relearning, not just learning, but relearning. And uh, you tend to stay the course if you uh, uh, drink a lot during uh, adolescence and young adulthood. So I wonder about the, the impact from your perspective. Yeah, I think I, I don't know how severe an alcoholic he was. You know, he never used that term himself. And he didn't want to be thought of as a reformed alcoholic. One of the things I came across talking to some people who knew him that period was that he did use some Alcoholics Anonymous literature. Uh, he and Laura did. And, you know, that was sort of part of his, his effort to quit. Um, but um, I think he, he did use religion more than anything else. And it, and it was an act of will. I mean, whatever you think about him, he is, among other things, a very physically disciplined man and he did manage to control this behavior but um, people who who study alcoholism do sometimes talk about the phenomenon of people who who con contain their drinking without addressing the underlying issues you know the idea that someone can be a dry drunk and one of the symptoms of that you know can be a kind of anger you know powerful expressions of anger and uh, I do get that I do get that vibe from from Bush a lot you know he he always drank in, in 2000 when I was covering the campaign. I was be surprised. He drinks non-alcoholic beer, and non-alcoholic beer is sort of a non-drinker's way of saying I'm dying for a drink. And I can't, you know, and it has a little alcohol, and I think you're not supposed to actually drink it in AA. They don't tell, they don't let you drink non-alcoholic beer. So I think it's, I, th I think it's a big factor. Yeah, and I, I just, it just we have so many questions. I just, but thank you. Interested in your book about your comment about how kind of lonely he is and why he is reading things and using as his source of advice history, uh, you know, kind of um, stories about past presidents, heroes, uh, rather than real people. And I'm just wondering, as a journalist who covered him, um, you know, do you have a sense? Um, what is the complexity of this feeling? There's Washington, of which he's a part, the press, which is of Washington. Uh, you know, have you seen any relationships that he has had with anybody other than, say, Karl Rove? He has relationships which, which you've all seen in Alessandra Pelosi's film, you know, kind of which are very superficial. But have you seen any real relationships that he's had with other people? Well, he has. He absolutely has real friends, and he has real relationships in his family. I think he's particularly close to the two youngest and apolitical siblings, uh, Doro and, and Marvin, who you know are up at Camp David many weekends, and he clearly gets along with them. He's he's very. I mean, he has a kind of 
gift for friendship, something his father was famous for. He's, he's very good at getting along with people, with bonding with them quickly. But at the same time, I think the natural tendency for presidents to become isolated, and I think he's become extremely isolated personally in his last so years. Don't involve say you're wrong. Uh, you know, I don't think they involve a lot okay. of challenge to them, but the, okay. but the history point is yeah. interesting because he does. There was this list that, that uh, well, it wasn't a complete list, but he supposedly had a reading contest with Karl Rove last yeah. year, and he claimed to have read over 80 books mm -hmm. last year, which seemed seemed very surprising. Mm -hmm. But and everyone said everyone's reaction was that's impossible, and my reaction is what else is he doing? Yeah. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> he's you know he's. He rides his bicycle, but he has no social life. He doesn't go out. You know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't watch TV. I mean, I think that probably is his, his main form of recreation. But what he's reading, it was very heavy on history with some of the b books that came out on the list. And he was particularly reading about a few historical figures who, who he thought provided a kind of template for his ultimate vindication, and particularly Truman. And he's talked openly about the Truman example. But Truman's a very very good example for him because Truman was, was vilified as president, was basically a very unpopular president, left office in disrepute with very low approval rating. Um, but over time, historians revised the view, and the consensus view is both that Truman was a good president, or, or a very good president, uh, and also that he, it, it, this sort of formative period in, in post-Second War American policy at the beginning of the Cold War, that Truman shaped these doctrines and institutions that molded everything that came after and that what it, at the time wasn't apparent in retrospect uh, looked much better. And Bush draws this analogy to the war on terrorism. And he thinks, well, I'm, you know, I'm standing up for what's right and I'm attacked for it. But when people look back, they'll see that I laid the groundwork, the framework, for, um, for this next period in history. But I, I need to say I don't think that I don't think that analogy holds up very well, and part of the reason I don't think it holds up very well is that Bush's search for a doctrine has been uh, so mutable. You know, he's had I, I think there have been six different Bush doctrines, and the last one contradicts the first completely. You know, he starts with this kind of hawkish, realist view of foreign policy in 19. 99 when he's running for president that he doesn't believe in nation building and doesn't think foreign policy should be social work and it's a hard-headed view of America's national interest and he ends up with this extravagant and idealism in his second inaugural address where he says America's mission is is to eliminate tyranny from planet earth and you know we're doing we're doing nation building in more in more than one nation and along there've been several steps along the way so it's sort of hard to say, well, if, you know, if there were a Bush doctrine that was going to be equal to the Truman doctrine, I mean, the Truman doctrine being only part of what we're talking about in this Cold War uh, framework, you know, which one would it be? Yeah. Um, all right, you said the decision to invade Iraq was July 2002. But That's I had my the, view. Well, I had the impression that it was, um, say, decided before he was elected or before they stole the election that they wanted Clinton to invade Iraq in 98 in the project for the new American century, and maybe that was some of the intensity. And the other part is, um, I think it was you that I heard say, like, once he decides something, that's it. Yeah. Um, and it seems like he decided a while ago about attacking Iran. And given the NIE and then pulling the rug out from everything, but you know, a few weeks ago he was talking to Olmert and saying, you know, I don't believe his rhetoric sounds like he still wants to do it. And what do you think is the well? Let me let me take the first one first. Yeah. The, the Iraq decision. I don't think that he had decided to Iraq, the Iraq coming into the White House. I think he had a predisposition, and I do think part of it was this personal thing with the Bush family. He thought. Saddam Hussein had, had tried to assassinate, you know, it wasn't just his father, it was his wife, his, his mother, two of his brothers um, on this trip to Kuwait. And it turns out there may not have been an assassination plot, and there almost certainly wasn't an assassination plot sponsored by Saddam, because we didn't find any records of this in the se secret police files. But Bush thought, and Clinton thought, that they, they tried to kill his whole family, you know, and there was a personal element to it. But at the same time, I don't think they saw that as the most urgent foreign policy problem. And what he wanted more than anything else was to develop a, a view of foreign policy. And that the, the argument for Iraq, I think, 
sort of came out of that, and particularly the, the reaction to the anthrax attacks and the fear of biological warfare in 2002. You're standing up, so I better not start talking about Iran. <laughs> no, what, what do you say? We are beginning to run out of time. But I think we've got four people, is that right, in line for questions? Is it four? Yeah. Okay. If all four people could come to the mic and ask their question, a short question, and then Jac Jacob will amalgamate them all and answer that, and then we're okay. going to stop. And I, I was going to say, I promise you, the answers are all in my book. Uh, what evidence do we have, if any, of the role that oil may have played in the decision to go to war? Uh, in a recent interview uh, with 60 Minutes, I recall uh, that Federal Reserve Board Chairman Greenspan said that in meetings he had expressed the fear that Saddam Hussein might uh, cut off the Straits of Hormuz uh, and make it difficult for oil delivery. At the same time, of course, we have an unusual situation okay. where both okay. Bu President Bush and Vice President Cheney uh, have family fortunes built on oil. Okay, uh, thanks. Go on to the next question. I'm curious if you did any research on George Bush's relationship with his mother. It strikes me that his mannerisms are similar to his mother's. Thank you. My question is somewhat similar. I wonder if you had any sense at all of the relationship between Laura and her in-laws or theirs with her? I'd be, I'd be interested in a little bit more about 9-11. And when uh, Bush was in Sarasota, he said he saw the first plane go in before on, the, on his way to the school. And they f since f the, the timeline isn't quite right, so I wonder about his moral compass and his easeability at which he can lie. Okay. And, and also the bin Laden connection with the family. Okay. So no problem. So this answer will encompass 9-11, Laura, Mom, and oil. Uh, and Iran. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have to work backwards, so I remember, try to remember the uh, First, September 11th. Well, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot you could say about uh, any one of these subjects. I, I could go on. Um, I think one of, one of the things that's so interesting to me about September 11th is that when Bush reacts in that school... Uh, in Sarasota, he is completely befuddled. People forget that first statement he made, but Bush went to the auditorium in that school and he said, terrorism will not stand. And the reason I think that's fascinating is it's a perfect echo of what his father said about, about Saddam's invasion of Kuwait. So he said, this will not stand. And I think his only, he didn't, part of his coming so late to politics and having so little background in foreign policies, he just didn't have any depth of experience to draw on, and his 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 uh, re response was so shaky for the first couple of days until you know Cheney helped him out until he sort of got a got a grip on things. Um, but um, but anyway, w you know, one of the arguments I make in my book, and you can judge this for yourself, is I de-emphasize September 11th and make an argument that the anthrax attacks in Washington were a much bigger factor in the invasion of Iraq because I think they created a kind of panic at the White House and they also led directly to the preemption doctrine to the idea that we had to stop these stop attacks before they before they happen okay working backwards Laura um, uh, Laura and her in-laws I, th I think the question was um, I think uh, I think they get along okay I think um, Laura's, Laura's a very interesting figure, and she was sort of a liberal. She, was a, she lived in Austin and taught in the inner city schools, and she seemed to have gotten away from this Republican women's club environment in Midland where she grew up. But then when she married uh, George, George W., she went right back into it and became, you know, the perfect, the perfect wife. That's uh, George W. Bush's phrase for her. And he said she's the perfect wife because she doesn't try to upstage me. This is very, very interesting, and she's and she clearly that's that's the role she wants. That's the role she's comfortable with, and that's she's very much she's like a lot of the women in the Bush family in that she runs the family. Uh, the the husbands have the political careers, and the wives manage everything. And I think she's been been comfortable with that role. But I think partly for that reason, she actually fits in pretty well with the family. Although Barbara Bush is, can be a very difficult woman, and I think they're inevitably, you know, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't want to be her daughter-in-law. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, am I going to get in trouble for saying that? No, um, not not with this crowd, I don't think. Um, and then Bar George George W. and his mother. Um, I think this, this strong affinity to the level of personality. His father was absent through much of his childhood. I think that's what a lot of his anger is about. Um, his father was off building the oil biz international oil business, then starting his political career. And George, the oldest son, was alone at home with his mother in this very isolated place in Midland, Texas. And his younger sister, Robin, tragically died of leukemia. The parents handled this f f in relation to him very badly. They didn't tell him the daughter was ill. Basically, suddenly, this little sister, who he was very close to, was gone, had died. And the family was very focused on moving forward, putting it behind them, not, not wallowing in the past. And it's, it sounds like, when you read the accounts, they didn't deal with it at all. And George W. was very angry about that, but his mother got very depressed when that happened. She does suffer from depression. She writes about this in her memoir. And he clearly was cast into this role as a little kid of having to take care of his mother, try to cheer his mother up, and also sort of to be the husband in these kind of poignant ways when his father was away. So it's, I think it forges this very, very powerful bond between them at one level. At the same level, there's a, there's a very, very testy relationship between the two of them. And I think the mother is, you know, has, has resisted the idea of the son's political career. She's always made this joke that, you know, the sort of... You know, guess what? My son's running for president. The bad news is it's George. You know, <laughs> and that's a joke. That's a joke with an edge of edge of truth to it. Um, all right, and we have to oil in Iran. Um, oil, I, I won't. I think that's too much of a subject even to start to get into tonight. You know, I don't think. Um, I mean, there's a reason reason why the war happened in in Iraq and and not Darfur. I mean, this is a strategically important place in the world. I don't accept the idea that we invaded Iraq to secure supplies of oil for, for American oil companies, that it was driven by Bush's in business interests. I don't, I don't really buy into any of that kind of thinking. At the same time, the strategic importance of the Persian Gulf is why that area was on everybody's radar screen, um, and is, it happened there for a reason. And lastly, Iran, I don't think um, that Bush had made the decision, any kind of decision, to attack Iran. Uh, when uh, the NIE came out, the National Intelligence Estimate came out and said that they are not working on a, on a nuclear bomb and essentially undermined whatever case there had been. But I do think Cheney was very much poised in that direction. And this was a case, you know, we'll never know. Let's hope we'll never know. Um, I, think, I think Cheney was making the argument. I don't think Bush has, had accepted it yet. Um, and what would have happened without that National Intelligence Estimate, I think, is anybody's guess his father and to have his own legacy and not his dad. Well, maybe there were people around him four years ago who felt that way, but now if you unpack that answer, there's a progression. First he says, it's not true that my sons do it saying this to get at me. Then he says, it bothers me that the intellectual snobs in New York are saying it. And finally he says, Karl Rove's responsible for it. <laughs> um, now as a kid growing up in Midland, Texas, um, George Bush b modeled himself on this heroic father. And I think it's um, easy to forget what a heroic figure Bush was, especially in his own family, this war hero, this successful businessman, this successful politician. And there's this great rosebud moment when George W. Bush is stretched out on the floor of the ranch house, which you can now visit in Midland, Texas. It's the George W. Bush birthplace or, or early family home. And uh, he's looking at this family scrapbook, and it is a little bit of rubber from the raft that saved his father's life when he was shot down over the Pacific. And you can just think a little bit what it's like to grow up with a father who had cast such an imposing shadow in the family. And of course, George W. Bush tried to do all of the things that his dad did. Um, he went to the same schools. He tried to play the same sports, mainly baseball. He tried to fly warplanes. He went into the oil business. He went back to Midland, Texas to go into the oil business. He ran for office when he ran for Congress in 1978. But for that whole first part of his life, he wasn't good at any of that. Um, and I think the fact that he was born to this tremendous privilege just made the sense of disappointment at not being good at it 
um, all the all the more disappointing to him. Um, he was clearly unhappy growing up. He developed a drinking problem, and he developed, um, I think, what could be fairly called the nasty streak. He cultivated this idea of himself as someone who would never break a sweat, who wasn't trying that hard, even though he was, in a sense, trying very hard. And he tried to give off this idea, well, I might not be accomplishing what my dad did, but I'm not really trying to accomplish anything. But as he got older, this contrast in their stories and their situations got even more dramatic. At age 30, his father was worth a million dollars, and a million dollars was a lot of money back then. He had a house, a burgeoning business, a growing family. Now, at age 30, the son, George W. Bush, was living over a garage, surrounded by dirty clothes. He was out drinking most nights. His business wasn't working. And uh, at that point in Midland, Texas, was a, an oil boom, the oil boom in the 1970s, which was an even bigger boom than his father uh, uh, made, his, made his mark in in the 1950s. And it wasn't working. And it was very interesting how they each approached the oil business. His father approached the, the business very methodically from the ground up. He started painting oil rigs. He was a salesman of drill bits. He did every, every thing you can do to understand it. Uh, but his son thought it was a matter of luck whether you struck oil. And he kept rolling the dice, and, the, and they kept coming up snake eyes. Um, and then he rolled them again by running for Congress when he had no real qualifications in 1978. Um, and... Uh, you know, one of the things that happened, he lost that race, and, and one of the things that was happening in that, soon after that period is his younger brother Jeb, who he had a very competitive relationship with, six and a half years younger, started to succeed. And Jeb, in a way, lived the real family dream by moving to a new, lighting out for new territory in Miami, um, making some money in business, a different place, a different business, uh, the real estate business. And then Jeb went into politics and became uh, Secretary of Commerce in Miami. And I think seeing his younger brother succeed in that way and become the sort of family success story and the repository of the hopes of the next generation for the Bush family is part of what motivated George W. to pull himself together uh, and to stop the big one in Iraq by the son's need to rebel, to differentiate himself, to exceed his father and diminish his father. But at the same time, I think Bush has been embarked on a kind of effort at vindication, not just of a father who was turned out of office by the Clintons, people the Bush family has contempt for, but vindication of the Bush family as a whole. And I think Bush's uh, presidency, and I think you could argue, in fact, Bush's entire life has organized itself around this complicated interplay of parental emulation and contradiction. Um, I think it's been a painful business in the Bush family. And uh, let me just give you one little vignette, which is from 2004, at the time of the Republican Convention in New York. Uh, former President Bush has been incredibly disciplined about not allowing there to be any distance between himself and his son on policy, criticize his son in any way to suggest that he feels implicated by his son's decision. But um, this one time in, in 2004, uh, former President Bush was actually on Don Imus' show. And I think he was feeling so wounded by the way his son had been treating him that, that he, he let it out. And uh, what, the, what set him off was when Imus quoted a remark that George W. Bush, President Bush, had made in an interview with the Washington Times when he said that in Iraq, he didn't intend to cut and run like they did in 1991. And uh, this somehow got to his father. And he said, well, I didn't like that much. He said, frankly, it hurt a little bit. And th then he went on. And I thought this was an incredibly revealing answer. Former President Bush said, I don't think he personally felt that I have to compete with my dad. You read all this psychobabble stuff. That's me. And I, and I know it's not true. These damn issues now, for me, they don't matter. What does matter, though, is, is if they have assigned things to him in some salon in the Upper East Side of New York that he's trying to get out from under the shadow to escape. frames this in the language of Greek tragedy and Shakespearean drama. In the, in the Bush tragedy is that the son's ungovernable relationship with his father ended up governing us all. As we thought about in parallels of previous presidents, LBJ with Macbeth, uh, Nixon with uh, Richard III, Jacob Weisberg 
finds Bush's darker side uh, in Prince Hal of the uh, Shakespeare Henry series. Um, he um, then says after uh, placing that uh, role for uh, President Bush as, Bush as Prince Hal, that back to, again, he's trying to find the, bl the black box that explains this just flame-out crash that he has, as he uh, diagnoses the Bush presidency. And uh, that's what our book is all about. He feels he's found the black box, and he's here tonight to tell us what's in it. Barbara, thank you so much for that nice introduction and for having me here at Politics and Prose. Uh-oh, I can tell what that is. Better turn that off. Um, and it's great to see so many people here. I'm sorry there aren't seats for everyone, but I take this as uh, evidence that although exhaustion with the, with the Bush presidency is fairly advanced, there are still people interested in trying to understand what went wrong. Um, my story is about the downfall of, of a family dynasty as well as a political dynasty. And the part I thought I would talk about tonight is the personal, the familial, the psychological side of the story. And I don't mean to offer a simplistic Freudian reading of George W. Bush. I want to offer a complicated Freudian reading. <laughs> um, I think you can partially explain uh, Bush's choices, including I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the owners here, and I want to welcome Jake, Jacob Weisberg. Uh, Jacob is the editor-in-chief of Slate magazine. Uh, he's had a long, uh, rich career in journalism. He's worked for the New Republic. He writes for, for the New York Times, the Financial Times, Vanity Fair, and a number of other uh, journalism sources. Uh, and incidentally, that he was he was not editor in chief of Slate in two thousand. In two thousand, he was a political reporter much further down the rung rung for Slate, and he was covering the new President Bush at that time. Uh, I don't know how many people here read the op-ed piece, piece that was in the New York Times that Jacob wrote two years two days ago. Uh, and it was a very, very, I found it was a very interesting piece because that he spoke of uh, President Bush's 2001 State of the Union address in which the Bush spoke as a compassionate conservative who wanted to extend Medicare benefits, preserve Social Security, and protect the environment. The Bush tragedy, the title of our book tonight, is the story of how such fine words ended in such harsh realities. Uh, Jacob Weisberg is very pre precise uh, in his character characterization of Bush as not a bad president, but a failed president. Uh, he says he has no ax to grind with President Bush, but it is a, the intention of his book to help us understand the magnitude of the Bush failure. The father-son relationship between George H.W. and George W. lies at the core of the second pre Bush presidency and his spectacular flame-out. Uh, Jacob Weisberg 